Have you found your purpose in life? I know I'm supposed to be here. And you get encouraged and you don't quit. That gives you your endurance. When you know that God has got you in a certain place for a certain reason. War Room's T.C. Stallings tells how he pursued his passion on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. The movie War Room has been called a faith-based David versus the secular Goliaths in the entertainment industry. The film was produced on a $3 million budget and made more than $67 million. It also made the lead actor a star. Take a look. T.C. Stallings is a professional athlete turned actor. You may remember him from his role as T.J. in the Kendrick Brothers film, Courageous. Three years later, T.C.'s career reached new heights with his breakout performance as Tony Jordan in the 2015 faith-based film, War Room, which soared to number one in the box office in its second week. In his first book, The Pursuit, T.C. shares how he has courageously pursued God's purpose for his life, even when it wasn't easy. He wants to equip and encourage you to do the same. I, you know, like, I don't know what he wants me to do. But that's why you want to get passionate about the pursuit of finding out. Because when you do, this says God will complete it. Jesus will complete it. The Holy Spirit will complete it. So when you get rough spots, you're encouraged by the fact that, nah, it ain't over. This ain't the end. This ain't the end. I, I mean, I lost this job. I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get another one. This, this had to be, I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to be here. And you get encouraged and you don't quit. That gives you your endurance. When you know that God has got you in a certain place for a certain reason. All right, TC is with us now. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When you were cast in War Room, did you really think, I mean really, that it was going to do so well at the box office? Um, not number one. No. I remember we were um, at the premiere. We were all getting together at, and we, we had done three premieres. Uh, and we were saying to ourselves, okay, just uh, as a fan, what do y'all think War Room was going to do? And we were all throwing out numbers and stuff. And we all say, well, it'd be cool. When you look at the history of their films, they've done well, you know, top four, top five. But number one, um, just unbelievable that it did what it did. You're quite a good actor because uh, you're such a nice guy, but in the role you played in Tony, you did a very nice job being a very mean husband, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so funny because when, when I'm watching it in theaters with people, um, the first 40 minutes or so, it's just like you're just sinking down in your seat. Because the, the women in there is like, oh, I could just slap him in his head right now. You know, it's just, and it's just, it's so, and, and you know, and I remember those moments where we knew we had to make, take the audience there because you want to take them on this emotional ride where later on they're cheering for you. And so uh, it was challenging. Why do you think the film resonated? with so many people? Uh, I think there's a, a lot of reasons. When I get asked, I think of a few things. Number one, you know, with Christians, you're talking about Jesus and prayer. Those are the pillars of our faith. These are things you should do every single day. And, um, and then th this film is, is excelling and the world is talking about Jesus and prayer. So that's one thing. The other thing I think there's, you can see yourself in a lot of the different characters in the film. Yeah. Um, you know, I think men, you know, resonate, you know, some, with Tony and his jo journey. Then there's women resonating with, um, you know, Elizabeth's journey. Then you got people who are mentoring other people will resonate with Miss Clara and you got kids. And I think everybody can see themselves somewhere in there. And you see in these real life situations and how um, not everything always works out. I think that's a nice element to it. So I just think you can see yourself there. And, um, and again, we're, we're trying to teach everybody how to pray their way out. And I think a lot of people will learn how, want to learn um, how to have a stronger prayer life. Well, let's touch on something you mentioned that not everything works out. Because if you had followed your own purpose, you've written a book about finding God's purpose for your life. Yeah. Your plan was to be in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that journey. Yeah, starting at age 12, all I wanted to do was make it to the NFL. You know, I remember writing those goals down and, and, and chasing them with everything that I had. And because there's nothing inherently wrong with football, it's not sinful to want to play football, it's a, it's a good thing. But that didn't mean it was the thing that God wanted me to do. Um, but yet, uh, I chased it with everything I had. And um, I, I went to University of Louisville, played well there. And all the stars, as they like to say, seemed to line up to where I'm going to make it here. And so everything was just lining up for me. Uh, but in 2008... Um, I had the best season that I had ever had, and I thought that would turn into uh, NFL success. And then when it didn't, I was just exhausted. Yeah. Like, I literally, literally just got tired of failing, and I didn't understand because it was so positive, and I had all these great plans. I was going to glorify the Lord, and all these things sound good. Yeah, and why wouldn't he let you do that? If your plan's it's, to glorify him, he should make the path straight, right? Yeah, and that's, that's what we think. But uh, the Bible clearly tells us, and Scripture after Scripture tells us, that it's not my plans that are blessed and ordained, even if they involve Jesus or whatever. It's his plans that are blessed and ordained. And so um, I had to trade in 
my will for his will, and that's when everything changed. You think sometimes we say, okay, God, here's the plan I'm gonna pursue, now please bless it, as opposed to saying, what do you want for me, and give me the strength and faith to follow. That's exactly what a lot of us do, I know I did. And you, you, you take something and you try to make it good, and it's almost like you, you, you uh, uh, like you, what to say, proposition God, like a proposition. Mm -hmm. You proposition God, like, okay God, uh, if you allow me to play football, I'm gonna give all the money to the poor. I'm gonna do this. I'm you, doing this for you. Yeah, I'm doing, this is for you, and, and, and it'll be such a good testimony, and this person will be, you know, we can point this person to you, and you do all this because you want to do it. And then it's funny, it's like, you know, God's like, okay, well how about I want you to go and be persecuted in another country. Um, that could glorify me too. You know, if it's all about my glory, you'll do whatever I want you to do, right? And that's when it's like, uh, I don't know. And so I've learned to just, if you let the Holy Spirit lead out in purpose, um, it gives you the courage, it gives you the strength, it makes sense of what you're doing. Because in my own human nature, I'm gonna do what I'm comfortable with and what I wanna do. And I try to bring God along for the ride as opposed to letting yeah. him lead. And so God opened doors for you to be it, become an actor, a mm -hmm. series of things that you didn't see coming, that he opened the door. So tell us how people can find their purpose and plan. It's easier said than done. I think, uh, and this is so, <clears throat> This question being answered to me has just been a life-changing thing. And, it, and, and it's funny because I don't think it's nothing revolutionary or radical or anything. I open up the Bible one day, I'm just reading, and I see in Scripture, Psalms 139, 16, where he says, I saw you before you were born. Every day of your life was recorded in my book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I looked at that. Bible can't lie. God says, I made a life for you. Consult me about it. And I just literally did that. And it changed everything. That's how you find your purpose, by asking God, what did he make you to do? It's that simple. And, and, and then you, but again, you want to have faith that he will answer that. And when he does, that's the rough part. I didn't say it was easy. It's simple, um, but that doesn't mean it's easy. But once he answers that, then you got to pray for the strength and courage to pursue this road because yeah. you don't know what it is, but that's what faith is all about. Just have under a minute left. So tell us uh, a key principle that God showed you on your, on your exploration of his word. Well, I list, I list 14 of them, and there's a couple that I can, I can highlight. You know, one of them is Matthew 721 is one where he says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. And when I look at Psalm 139, 16, he says, This is what I made you to do. That means that's his will for my life. And if I don't do that, that means I'm just, I could be doing a lot of cool things, but I'm not lining up with Jesus and doing them. I'm just doing whatever I want. That scripture is sobering. So that was one. Then the other one is James 4, James 4, 13, where it says your life is but a mist. Yeah. You could be here today, gone tomorrow. And that creates a sense of urgency. I don't know what my tomorrow holds. I could be gone. And in my book, I nearly, I talk about nearly dying in a car crash. And that woke me up. And if Jesus looked at me and said, you know, when I die, I need him to be able to say, you've been doing everything I called you to do. You're living out your purpose. And, uh, and that's the other principle to help people get a sense of urgency and don't wait because you don't know what tomorrow holds. So. It's a great reminder and it's a great book. We thank you for being here. TC's book is called The Pursuit. It includes his personal story and also, as he said, 14 scriptures and chapters to help you discover God's purpose for your life. I encourage you to pick it up. Well, coming up, a look at the Jewish claims to the land of Israel. You just scratch the surface and you find a rich Jewish culture and history of more than 3,500 years, ever since King David built Jerusalem. The real story behind the oldest land dispute in history, that's after this. In 1967, Israel captured the West Bank from Jordan in the Six-Day War. Since then, Israel's presence there has been called illegal occupation and their claims to the land illegitimate. Even today, many world leaders refer to the West Bank as occupied territory. But are those terms historically correct? Here's a look at Israel's claims to the land. It's the oldest land dispute in history. For centuries, Jews and Arabs have both claimed to be the rightful owners of the land of Israel. Jewish claims to the land are based on four main arguments. The first is God's promise to Abraham. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion often said that the Bible was the Jewish mandate for settling the land of Israel. In the book of Genesis, God gave the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Israel. And the rest of the Bible tells the story of their descendants in the land. Moses led the Jews back to Israel after their exile in Egypt. And roughly 400 years later, around 1000 BC, King David conquered the city of Jerusalem 
and built his capital there. But the story of the Jews isn't limited to the borders of modern Israel. Their footprints have been traced throughout Judea and Samaria, now the Palestinian West Bank. Bethel, where Jacob dreamed of a ladder to heaven. Shiloh, the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. Bethlehem, the birthplace of King David. And Hebron, where the Jewish patriarchs are buried. This is all not just documented in the Bible and in history. It also reveals itself in every inch of the land. In any archaeological dig, you just scratch the surface and you find a rich Jewish culture and history of more than 3,500 years, ever since King David built Jerusalem 3,010 years ago. The Jewish rule over Israel was also documented outside the Bible, often by the enemies of Israel. In Egypt, an inscription on the Merneptah Stila proclaimed in the 13th century BC that Israel has been laid waste. In 840 BC, the Moabite king Mesha wrote about the house of David, as did another king a century later, Hazael of Damascus. In the first century AD, the Jewish historian Josephus described in great detail the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and its destruction by the Romans, a story confirmed by a relief in the Arch of Titus in Rome. Every day, archaeology yields more evidence of ancient Jewish culture dating back thousands of years. And in the 20th century, that historical connection has been recognized several times by international law. In 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issued a declaration calling for a Jewish homeland in Palestine, also known then as Southern Syria. Palestine included at the time all the territory which is now Israel, which is also Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and Jordan. In 1920, Allied leaders gathered in San Remo, Italy to divide the remains of the Ottoman Empire. They created the San Remo Resolution, which incorporated the Balfour Declaration. The resolution was signed by the members of the League of Nations, and the British were put in charge of Palestine. That meant they were legally bound to help the Jewish people build a state there. Two years later, in 1922, the League adopted the British Mandate for Palestine which recognized the historical connection of the Jewish people and the need for reconstituting their national home there. By that time, the land allocated to the Jewish people had been drastically reduced, with more than 75% of it going to the new Arab kingdom of Transjordan. The mandate was signed by all 51 members of the League of Nations, and once again, a Jewish state was guaranteed by international law. But 25 years later, that state still existed only on paper. And in 1945, the League was replaced by the United Nations. Article 80 of the UN Charter states that the UN would not alter existing states, peoples, or mandates, which means the UN legally recognized the right of the Jewish people to settle in Palestine, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. The United Nation is the legal successor and inheritor of the League of Nations, which means all obligations, commitments, and pledges of the League of Nations must be upheld by the United Nations Unfortunately, they did not do it in the case of Israel and the Jewish ownership over their land. In November 1947, the land intended for the Jews was divided once again. The UN voted to partition what was left of Palestine into two parts. 56% would be a Jewish state, with 43% going to an Arab state, 
to be annexed to Jordan. Once again, a Jewish state was mandated by international law. Israel declared its independence in 1948. And a year later, the new state was admitted to the United Nations. But despite numerous legal endorsements, Israel's borders would still be disputed for decades to come as Arab leaders incited violence against Israel. The Mufti, Hajj Amin al husseini said, what they, they, the United Nations, write with ink, we destroy it by blood. In 2002, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan famously used the phrase illegal occupation to describe Israel's annexation of the West Bank in 1967. But Anand's critics were quick to point out his use of the word illegal was incorrect because the West Bank never legally belonged to Palestinian Arabs in the first place. Palestine was ruled by the Ottoman Turks from 1516 to 1918. Then for the next 30 years, it was controlled by the British until Israel declared its independence. During the war that followed, the Kingdom of Jordan invaded the West Bank and formally annexed the land in 1950. There is a lack of historical understanding and also there is an abuse here by this saying of international law. Since the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, was annexed by Jordan, it was a Jordanian territory, and in 1967, the Six Days War, when Israel had, again, a campaign of self-defense, when three armies of Syria, Jordan, and Egypt were surrounding us, ready to drive us into the sea, Israel won the war, and as a result, we took into possession the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. This land was captured from Jordan. Since Israel recaptured the land from Jordan, it now belongs to Israel, according to international law. One judge on the International Court of Justice wrote the following about the 1967 war. A state acting in lawful exercise of its right of self-defense may seize and occupy foreign territory, as long as such seizure and occupation are necessary to its self-defense and where the prior holder of territory had seized that territory unlawfully. The state which subsequently takes that territory in the lawful exercise of self-defense has against that prior holder better title. We bought our land in the blood of our soldiers. We didn't start with the war. The Arabs start with the war. All over the world, the idea when someone started with the war and he failed, he paid the price. He paid the price. So why do we have to pay the price now? The last claim the Jewish people make for the land of Israel focuses not on how they got it, but what they did with it. Today, Israel's population is well over 8 million. But in 1850, only 350,000 people lived in Israel and the West Bank. In 1857, the British consul in Palestine reported that the area was empty of inhabitants and that its greatest need is a body of population. A decade later, British scientist H.B. Tristram wrote that whole villages there are rapidly disappearing from the face of the earth. An American writer, Mark Twain, wrote this about the Jezreel Valley. There is not a solitary village for 30 miles in either direction. There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. Today, many Palestinian Arabs claim that the Jews stole Arab land, evicted the owners, and left thousands of Arab farmers homeless. But is that the real story? Let's take a look. As early as the 1850s, Jewish people started buying land in Palestine, but their choices were limited by Arab sellers. 
The Arabs settled mainly in mountainous areas, and they did not offer those lands for sale. The Arabs wanted to sell land in places where they did not live, in places which they had left in the past. Records show that most of the land purchased by the Jews belonged to a small group of wealthy Muslim families, most of whom didn't even live in Palestine. The Arabs were from many walks of life. Effendis who lived in Beirut and in Damascus, as well as locals. Also people who lived in the rural villages. All of them were willing to sell their land. There was always more land available than the demand for them. From the beginning, the Jewish policy was clear. No Arabs were to be removed from their land against their will. In 1920, Zionist labor leader David Ben-Gurion announced that under no circumstances must we touch land belonging to fellahin or work by them. Only if a fellah leaves his place of settlement should we offer to buy his land at an appropriate price. The Jewish National Fund bought the lands legally in order to fully secure the ownership of these lands. The Arabs were not evicted from the lands. They received compensation and the full process for the lands. That compensation was documented by the British Peel Commission in 1937. The group had been sent to Palestine to investigate clashes between Arabs and Jews. Their report shows that of the 664 Arab workers dispossessed by land sales, 347 were resettled by the British government for free. The rest refused help and found employment elsewhere. Not only did the Jews buy the land legally, they also paid 10 times the normal rate. In 1944, the going rate for rich, fertile soil in Iowa was $110 an acre. While in Palestine, Jews were paying more than $1,000 an acre for arid, rocky land. They say they are crazy. They buy this land. It's dirty land. It's no good land. But they are not stupid. And they know that we must work very hard. And they work very hard. Look what we have. We are only 66 years old. And look what we have already. In the 19th century, life was hard under Ottoman rule for Arab workers in Palestine. Many had lost their farms to heavy Turkish taxes or Bedouin raiders. There were no schools, no electricity, and little sanitation. The average life expectancy for an Arab male in Palestine was 30. With the arrival of the Jewish settlers, all of that started to change. With hard work, they turned swamps into vineyards, farms, and citrus groves. They introduced electricity to Palestine and improved the sanitation. They also worked to eradicate the mosquitoes that caused malaria. And the local Arabs benefited from their work. Over a 20-year period, the infant mortality rate for Arab children was cut in half and the life expectancy for Arab men increased by 12 years. The Jewish landowners hired many of them to help work the land and paid them better than their Arab employers. First of all, following the purchase of land, the Arab population had income. With the help of this money, they could improve their living, and the Arab society could raise their standard of living. So because of Jewish purchase of lands, the economic and social conditions of the Arab society were better. Arabs from neighboring countries flocked to Palestine to take advantage of the higher standard of living. From 1922 to 1947, the total Arab population in Palestine more than doubled. In the city of Haifa, the number of Arabs increased by 290%. In Jerusalem, 131%, and in Jaffa, 158%. In 1939, 
Jewish scholar Martin Buber described the cooperation between Arabs and Jews in a letter to Mahatma Gandhi. The Jewish farmers have begun to teach their brothers, the Arab farmers, to cultivate the land more intensively. Together with them, we want to cultivate the land, to serve it, as the Hebrew has it. The more fertile this soil becomes, the more space there will be for us and for them. We have no desire to dispossess them. We want to live with them. By the time Israel declared independence in 1948, the Jewish people had already built a strong network of communal farms that stretched from the Galilee to the Negev. They'd also built schools, hospitals, roads, and cities. In other words, they were already functioning as an independent state. When Ben-Gurion declared the foundation of the State of Israel in 1948, he already had a base, a territorial foundation of lands and settlements, a large number of settlements spread throughout Israel, settlements built on lands purchased by the Jewish people. Despite the valid historical and legal claims of the Jewish people to their land, Israel's borders are still being negotiated after nearly seven decades of statehood. Even though there is no doubt, not historic, not moral, not archaeological doubt about the connection of Israel to the land and the land to Israel, Israelis are willing to compromise just in order to save lives, just in order to achieve peace. We will wait until we have a partner on the Palestinian side which is trustworthy, which does not believe in the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people as a way to build their own national narrative and willing to live with us in peace and cooperation. Well, you've been watching part two of our latest documentary, Whose Land Is It? If you want to see the story again, go to 700clubinteractive.com. We're also offering the documentary on DVD and Blu-ray for just $10. And if you'd like a copy, give us a call. The number's toll-free, 888-777-1999. And tomorrow, we'll look at the Palestinian refugee problem and why it remains unsolved after almost 70 years. Thanks for joining us today. We want to leave you with these words from the 19th chapter of Proverbs, verse 21. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I want to remind you, if you need prayer for anything in your life, we'd love to pray with you. Give us a call at 888-777-1999. There's always someone here at CBN to pray with you. I'm Andrew Knox, and we thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on 700 Club Interactive. Bye-bye.